Hey, it's Elwyn Robinson, creator of Genetic Insights and author of the Rejuvenate Blueprint. And so in this episode, we're going to be talking about questions like, uh, what is the best weight loss strategy? And especially, you know, is it ozempic or semaglutide? Um, is it fasting? Is it intermittent fasting? Is it juice fasting? And so how did this episode come about? Well, my good friend, uh, Kyle Kostechka, who is the um, uh, who is a business development manager at a company called ClickBank. He actually has his own podcast as well, ClickBank Podcast, if you uh, want to check that out. Uh, we were just talking about health stuff, and he was asking me some questions. Um, and he's been very, uh, what's the word, transparent before about how I've helped him in his own health journey on his podcast. So, you know, we're, we're able to talk about that freely. But um, he was you know, considering various weight loss options. And I was saying, mm, I don't really <laughs> think that these strategies are ultimately going to be the most effective. And so uh, he said, you know what, you should actually do a podcast about this uh, with a little bit more of a confrontational tone. Because, you know, basically, he didn't kind of agree with me, which is, of course, fair enough. And so I said, okay, well, we haven't done those, you know, that style of podcast before. And, you know, I know, I know it's not really Chrissy's style to be that kind of, um, you know, argumentative, um, <laughs> kind of challenging interviewer. And that's, you know, totally fine. And he said, well, I could do it. And I said, okay, that's great. Let's do it. Let's do an episode. And so the intention of the episode is really um, for those of you who already agree that none of those things are really an effective strategy for weight loss, which I know there will be some of you, um, for instance, maybe those of you from the VP community, um, I would say that it's worth listening to from the perspective of um, like how you could, um, if you struggle with it, explain to other people, friends, family, whoever it may be, why these you know currently very popular strategies aren't actually a very good idea. And for those of you, of course, and there's a lot of people who found me through, you know, uh, peptides and optimization and stuff, you probably are considering those strategies. Um, it gives you an alternative strategy, sorry, an alternative perspective on why those might actually not be a good idea. And of course, it you get it from someone who is being effectively grilled, <laughs> which is what Kyle's doing, as opposed to it being a friendly interview. So you can hear my that's not a good idea perspective really, you know, repeatedly uh, questioned and challenged and interrogated rather than, um, you know, just having me say it without that. So uh, I hope that it's, um, I hope that it's entertaining for you to watch or listen to that way. If uh, you do like it and you would like to hear more of these episodes where there is a bit more of a, not hostile, but I guess like an argumentative or challenging or whatever you want to call it tone, then let me know in the comments below. Oh, the last thing that I just wanted to add is like his focus was exclusively on weight loss. And so therefore that's really what I talked about. Some of the things that he, that we talked about, uh, that we talk about later in the episode, like fasting, I just want to make clear, it's not that I think that there is no benefits to these. That's not true. And I have discussed that recently on an episode I think on my controversial opinions um it's just that it's not a strategy that is good for weight loss that's my contention and so that's all we really talk about here so if you feel like I'm you know missing some of the additional benefits to all the things that I say are not a good strategy here I'm not arguing with that point the episode really is focused on weight loss exclusively so if you are uh, wanting to lose weight, we've tried to lose weight. This is definitely one that I do recommend watching all the way because because he keeps uh, challenging me, it takes a while for me to you know finally get to my point as to why I do think is a better strategy that makes more sense. So keep watching, keep listening. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. As always, YouTube's really the place to go for comments and I do reply to comments personally. And I hope you enjoy this episode. Dude, Ellen, thanks so much for having me today and having this conversation. I know you haven't done something like this before, but I really wanted to talk to you and get your opinions um, because I know you have a lot of them. And I have been talking with uh, my wife, which I know your name, but we're going to call her my wife for this because she doesn't want that blasted all over the internet. Um, but we've been looking at the whole smegalotide, like 
uh, Ozembic route with all these celebrities, and we have friends that have lost like 20 pounds, 30 pounds, and they said it's just the easiest thing ever. Everyone's like, take a pill, or some people lie and say like, oh, I've just been, you know, walking more, and they somehow lost 50 pounds in two months. But it just feels like a perfect solution. Just cut some weight off. I don't have to do a lot of effort. And honestly, like with it, it's like sold everywhere. It feels too simple and too stupid not to do it. But at the same time, anything, something's too stupid or too good um, to be true. I figure I should maybe check in with you. But my thoughts are this just feels like a no brainer for us to just trim out, get her, you know, we don't have blood, bad blood sugars, but why not make them better and lose some weight um, in the way that it feels like everyone around us is doing right now. So I just want to get your thoughts on that and really understand a little bit more um, because I'm like 90% that I need to go down the Ozempic train at this point in time. Yeah, fair enough. And I know in your country, there's you know a lot of debate about how expensive it is and stuff like that, which I think is probably a more side issue to the more important one, which is the one you just brought up is, is it actually good in the first idea in the first place, right? Even if it was free, is it actually a good idea? The results are kick ass, man. Like it feels like every fat celebrity skinny. Now, every single person that I know that seemed like they were just going to live a life of like 800 pounds are now looking like models. So it, it feels just so effective and making so many people, happier and healthier. And I just don't see why I wouldn't want to be on the train of happier and healthier in America. Sure. Well, okay. So there's a lot of answers to this. I guess one of the simplest ones is appearances can be deceiving. So if you take up a methamphetamine habit as well, uh, you will also lose a lot of weight. Give it some of my teeth, uh, right? you know, it's really, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, you get the idea just because something makes you lose weight doesn't mean it's innately a good thing, even though there are a lot of benefits to losing weight. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, that's true. I guess I, I get that, right. There's, there's unhealthy. I mean, you could probably get cancer and look a lot of, lose a ton of weight too. And that's not awesome. Um, you know, except for those couple periods before, you know, and you're like, damn, I'm looking good. <laughs> so, but, um, uh, no, no, I, I could, I could appreciate that. But at the same time, like, it is such a huge piece of social equity in America, right? If you're if you're overweight and you don't look good, you will get treated worse. You will have less job opportunities. You life's just harder. So, and I can't speak for anywhere else except for where I live. Um, but I would also say that that appearance carries a lot of value. Um, so, where it might might be deceiving, like it sure is something that I want, and I know a lot of people want as well because it matters here. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, everything. And I'll do some heroin cost. if I have to. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, everything has a cost in life, and you're right. There is more to life than only health, or there is more to life than only health until you have a serious health issue, and then usually people feel like health is all that matters. You know, there's a lot of people who uh, feel that way. Uh, there's a saying, you know, a, a man who's healthy has a thousand wishes, but uh, an unhealthy person only has one, which is to be healthy again. It's one of those fundamental things. Um, you know, a thought experiment for that, for instance, is um, if I gave, you know, if I gave you $100 million, but you had to have a cold for the rest of your life, just a cold, and uh, you, you know, nothing would work for it, no, there would be no cure, no treatment, none of the over-the-counter medications or whatever that make you feel better would work, would you be willing to feel that way for the rest of your life for the sake of the money? Hmm. Man, it's an interesting question because it's like I needed – what degree of cold would I be dealing with, right? So no, I, I do think that that would kind of suck, right? A bad one. Yeah. Well, the other side is all that money kind of doesn't matter anymore because, um, you know, wealth provides a lot of access to health oftentimes, um, at, least, at least here in the States, right? Like the more money you have, the more likely – you are to be able to be healthy, which we go into that Ozemba argument is kind of part of that, right? Because it's not cheap. Um, but if you have the the if you could afford to get yourself there um, and, and get it, it, it can make a big impact. Um, so no, I, I do think that's fair. That you're right. It, it matters that you're doing it right because I don't think I'd take a hundred million dollars to feel like shit all the time um, <laughs> for the rest of your life. Yeah. The only people who say yes to that question, by the way, is people who are like truly very selfish, sorry, selfless. And I'm not that category. Other were like, well, I can help so many other people with it. Like, I'm going to feel like crap for the rest of I my life. I was going to say like, um, I'd be like, well then I'd give it away really quickly and then just try and maybe get through my kids to a cer certain age and just die. But that doesn't sound fulfilling. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's not it's not very inspiring at the very least, right? Even if it's a sacrifice you may be willing to make. So that's the point. So health is something extremely valuable. I understand what you said about people treat you better when you've lost weight and all the rest of it. Okay, so let's talk about Ozempic, yeah. right? Let's talk about how not, it works. That's not meth, so I'm not going to be, you know, in an alleyway somewhere, um, <laughs> like, destroying my body. So at least I don't think so, right? Well, you may end up in an alleyway, but probably not related to the Ozempic. Um does it destroy your body? I, yeah, I guess that is, you know, probably the most important question. That's something that we're going to talk about today. So let's talk about uh, the best case scenario of Ozempic first. Before I go into all the horror stories and all the this could happen and that could happen, because I know a lot of people, if you say there's like a one in a hundred chance of this, or most people, except for the very neurotic kind of like, eh, but it's not going to happen to me. So I'm not worried about that. So let's not, not talk about, to begin with anyway, any of the exceptions, any of the, there's a small chance that blah, 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 which are actually pretty significant. But let's just talk about a best case scenario. Actually, I'm going to ask you something that's even more base level, and I should know this, but I not like, this is probably my, my bad. I have not researched it. Like what? really does it do like i don't even really fully understand what it does besides make you lose weight and help with blood sugar that's really all that i understand it seems like it, i've heard some people say it's an appetite suppressant i just don't really even understand what it does just more what the results are so before we jump into best case scenario can you just tell me what it, what's doing to my body yeah well that yeah it was related so yeah let's let's start with that what it does to your body uh and the simplest level is it slows significantly the digestive process uh especially the part of the emptying of the stomach into the next phase of the digestive process so what that means is you will feel full quicker and for longer that's the simple answer gotcha okay but i mean that that seems like if it's slowing the process down wouldn't that lower your metabolism wouldn't that make you gain more weight or is it just more of a trick of the brain kind of thing it definitely does slow the digestive system and it definitely does slow down your metabolism which is one of my primary objections to it and that's we're definitely going to get into that um but the reason why to answer your question you know directly why you don't gain weight despite it slowing your metabolism is because you do eat so much less because your digestion is moving so much more slowly. That's one thing. That's a best case scenario. That's for the people who take it and don't feel anything. But forget about the you know one in a hundred side effects or whatever. A very common side effect, so common it's not really a side effect, it's actually really part of the mechanism of how it works, is you take it and you feel god awful sick for several days after you take it. You feel like, in fact, you've been poisoned. And so, um, you know, one person, this is a guest I've had on my podcast before, Grant Genero, he wrote a great article about it. I'm not saying he's right, but he um, theorized that the primary action of how Ozempic and these other equivalents work is actually because they contain another ingredient called phenol. Now, phenol um, is a poison and... Um, all the effects that you would expect of a poison, which is uh, you know, nausea, headache, reduced appetite, um, these are like the same effects that people experience with Ozempic. So there is an argument to be made that one of the reasons that it helps you lose weight is simply because you've poisoned yourself. And just as if you were to go and eat somewhere and get food poisoning, for instance, right, you eat some old shrimp or whatever, like you're going to lose weight because you're not going to feel like eating for several days afterwards. Now, imagine if you went and got food poisoning every week and every week you had several days afterwards where you barely felt like eating anything because you felt sick of a, sick as a dog because you've just poisoned yourself. So, so you're saying it's something that happens every single time you get the injection on that weekly basis for that week course. You're going to be at a two to three days where you just feel like shit. Just, just some understanding, right? And to some people, it's even more like four or five. Yeah. Now, to qualify, not everyone gets that response, but a lot of people do. So much so that it's not a side effect. It's really, really common. It's maybe half of people, maybe more, something like that. Um, so a lot of people have this feeling of feeling really sick after they've taken it. And in fact, the way it works, you normally start with a really small dose, like 0.25 milligrams. This is 
like, like an injection once a week. And the way it works is you have to get used to that first. And then once your body's used to that and you don't feel as sick anymore when you have that dose, then you up the dose and you take 0.5. And then again, you start feeling really sick again. And then once you're used to that and you can cope with that, then they up the dose and then eventually it goes up to, uh, I think, 1.5 or something like that. So, And some people can't even get there because they feel so sick when they up the dose, they, they just can't stand it. So feeling like you've been poisoned is an intrinsic part of the process for uh, you know a lot of people, even the majority of people. I don't know if it's been measured exactly. Let's say half of people. Well, I mean, no pain, no gain, Ellen. <laughs> you got to get there. Well, I, I will say we're, that doesn't sound awesome. Um, obviously, being sick every single time. I'm not gonna lie, but I also I have to admit though, like there's a lot of things when it comes to losing weight that don't feel awesome, right? Like even oftentimes certain diets, certain workouts, like when you get into it, feel pretty shitty. Um, and being sore and just going through all that stuff doesn't feel good. Like I've gone through plenty of diet phases, whether it's keto, flu or whatever, where I don't feel great. Um, but you, you overcome it, right? Because you know it's, and my understanding too is, with um, all this Zembic stuff is you're going through a course and then you're done, right? You're going to lose the weight, you'll get to your target, whatever you're wanting to accomplish, and you don't have to go through that all the time. So where that does sound not awesome, it's, you know, that it's That is temporary, also, right? no, that is not accurate. Um, if you stop taking it, you will put the weight on again. Just and right back, right away. There's nothing that's retained in there. Uh, the people who sell it, you know, will say you have to keep taking it for it to be effective. So this is built into it. This is not a course that you take and then stop and the then the weight stays off. Now, having said that, I've heard anecdotally some people who have had that experience, I'm not saying it never happens, but I'm saying that is not the purpose of it. If that happens to you, you're lucky. And according to the very people who sell and prescribe it, that is not the case. They say that you have to keep taking it for it to be effective and for you not to gain the weight back again. And so, and so with that really crappy feeling, so the, just to maintain the weight, right? Just to keep it yeah. off forever. I, I, and just to also apply to your previous point, I agree with you. If it was only feeling sick, but there was no real harm being done, then that could just be the price of doing business, right? That could be the price of the outcome you get. As you say, everything comes with a sacrifice. I think I said that 10 minutes ago. F fair enough. But the problem is not the feeling sick so much, although that is unpleasant and does stop a lot of people sticking with it. It's the fact, it's the question of, have I actually been poisoned? Is it not just a feeling? That, that is true, so I guess. So you said it feels like a poison, and that one guy said it is a poison. Is it like I mean, because it's a, it's an FDA approved product, so it can't be that bad. He said that phenol is in the list of ingredients for Ozempic, and it is a recognized poison, and so he was theorizing. That. Gotcha. I'm not saying he's definitely correct, but let's talk about. Let's assume that he's wrong. I'm just putting that out there as an example of an alternative perspective. But let's assume that the mechanism by which it works is the one that they tell you, right? So they tell you it's a you know it's a GLP one uh, agonist. Um, what's it doing? Basically, it's show it. It's slowing down the digestive process. It's especially slowing down the gastric emptying, which is uh, how long it takes for your stomach to do its job and then send the food on to the next part of the digestive process. And so, obviously, um, well, not obviously, just so you understand, it's when your stomach is full. And so, what 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 is stomach? Maybe I should explain that because not everyone knows. So, you got your mouth, you chew. Then you've got the esophagus, you've got this pipe going down there. The first place it goes is the stomach, which is on the left-hand side, uh, you know, uh, between your chest and your abdomen, right? That's the first place it goes. It's this big sack filled with acid. A lot of people know, where, you know what the stomach is because they know heartburn, <laughs> GERD, all these kind of things, right? So that's the first place it goes. The acid is like the first uh, part that starts to break stuff down. But it's not the end of the process. This is often confusing because even medical doctors, I know, they previously say, you know, have you got stomach pain? And then they point to like the navel, like where the intestines are. And it's like, that's not the stomach. So the stomach is what makes you feel full as in I can't eat anymore, right? Because it can Once get overworked goes... in there, essentially. If there's too much food, it's going to be like, get out of here. We have to break this down. So, which makes sense. What the Ozempic doing, slowing that process. You get filled faster, so you're not wanting to continue to consume food impulse eating reduces you're not snacking after meals just almost like a less invasive lap band surgery as it sounds like in a way 
Yeah, lap dance slightly different, but in a way, you're right. Yeah, it's the same mechanism of of like leaving the stomach full. <laughs> um, it, the stomach has the ability to expand greatly. So what happens to a lot of people who overeat over a long time is that the stomach gets a lot bigger than it should be, and that's where the lap band comes in, as it kind of makes it a lot smaller again, maybe like it was when you were twenty or whatever. Um, so the point is, if there's food in your intestines but not in your stomach, you could still be hungry again. You can still eat a full meal again or whatever. So the longer it stays in the stomach, the less you're going to be able to eat again. Literally able, you know, without feeling nauseous. So the problem, uh, is there a problem with that? There's many problems with that. One of the problems with that is, uh, there's, so if you, if you look at a lot of the ancient systems of the world, what they teach, and if you look at actually what a lot of alternative practitioners in the West right now teach, they say that the root of Sometimes they say most disease, sometimes they say all disease is in the gut. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah, I mean, I've definitely heard people talk about that before. I, honestly, I always str I struggle a little bit with it, especially when, you know, ancient stuff, old medicine. We used to only live to like 30. So when people are talking about medicine from periods when people died super early, I always kind of struggle with that. Is that but... true? When you actually look in history, you know, like, yeah, like peasants who couldn't afford, you know, basic hygiene or, you know, uh, food or whatever, serfs didn't live very long, but anyone who had reasonable means and in fact had worse hygiene and worse nutrition than the average person does today, they often did live to, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s. You know, if you if you believe in the Bible, there were people, you know, living a very long time. Yeah, like Noah lived for like years 250 ago. years or something like that. But I, I don't know if I could ever believe that, to be honest with you. So, well, fair yeah, enough. But, but if, you, if you just look at the aristocracy, for instance, the, the documented aristocracy throughout the last, you know, thousand years. If they weren't getting beheaded, lot... yeah, they would live to their 60s oftentimes. <laughs> Outside rare there's diseases and young princes and stuff like that. 60s, 70s, 80s even, you know, it wasn't that unusual. So... Uh, I mean, you're right, like on average, um, b because a lot of people used to die in childbirth. So, you know, if you use a mean average, uh, what that means is, you know, if, if half the children that you that you uh, uh, try and give birth to die, then, of course, the average age of your children goes in half because half of them die at childbirth. But if we look at pe people who actually survived the process of being children and got to adults, um, and who weren't in a desperate position of, as you say, war, violent death, who weren't in a desperate position of starvation, all that kind of stuff. People actually live to a similar-ish age than they did now if you control for those variables, actually. So first of all, but anyway. Um, so but I've heard of this about the, the all diseases coming from the gut or all conditions coming from the gut. And, and again, I, I'll be honest, it sounds... It sounds convenient to put it all in one place, especially if you wanted to sell people something about the gut, but I always struggle with that a little bit. It feels a little bit too extreme um, to me, but I'll, I'll listen. I'll continue. Well, fair enough. Yeah. yeah, look, fair enough. I don't like, you know, everything is down to one thing, theories either. So I don't know if I believe that it's all down to the gut either. But the point is for people to be making claims like that, there must be at least some degree that it's true like to some degree, a lot of diseases or problems originate in the gut. So and I, I will that... say I have seen, especially with the gut brain connection and like mental health and what you eat and how you feel like I, I can attest and I will give you that, that I have noticed even for myself specifically, what I put into my body will directly affect, especially the older I get mental health wise. So I know there's a connection there and I've, I've done some research to see that that, that is a direct tie in terms of what you're eating and what hormones get released into your brain. So that, that I know there's definitely some significance in the gut. I don't want to dismiss it all as a whole. It, it definitely matters. And just to go to science for a second, uh, you know, I, I use the ancient authorities <laughs> position first, but let's talk about science for a second. When I was looking at, you know, cause one of my brands is about, you know, rejuvenate, anti-aging. So when I was looking at anti-age supplements that actually work, uh, you know, with science behind it, I was interested that a lot of the things that people actually talk about are not really scientifically validated. But one of the things that really was is something called activated charcoal. And so activated charcoal is something that um, people take you know, orally. It goes through the digestive tract. And what it does is it basically soaks up poisons, endotoxin being probably the most important one, which is a natural byproduct of a lot of bacteria that exists in the gut. Even the ones that are supposed to be okay, they still create this stuff called endotoxin. And endotoxin... Uh, especially the more of it that gets into the bloodstream, definitely ages you. It creates inflammation, um, and most of the mainstream me Western medical um, practitioners say that inflammation is one of the root causes of all 
chronic diseases, which most people these days die of. Um, so it makes sense that anything that mops up that those toxins, like endotoxin, significantly and well, like activated charcoal what does, would slow down the aging process, which in fact it does. So I see loads of evidence for this, um, that if you have an excess of, uh, use the word toxins, but even the toxins is a bit pseud pseudoscience-y to some people. So toxin really just means poisons. So you can end up in, with poison in your digestive tract a few different ways. One of them, you can consume it, which you said you know, it might be the case. You know, it's tasty poison, poison or like whiskey, I understand, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's one option. Uh, but another option, in fact, I would say where the vast majority of poison is created is not that you are necessarily eating poison, but it's that you're eating something that an organism inside you feeds on and then a poison is a byproduct. And again, endotoxin is the most uh, you know common one. And so... So wait, just so I'm understanding, because th this is new to me at this point. So the idea is where I think it makes sense, like wh what you put in your body is going to make a difference. But... Um, you could have stuff that isn't necessarily inherently poison, but when it goes into your body, it becomes poison from the part these this bacteria in your stomach. Uh, more like maybe it's great, but this this not great bacteria eats it and they poo out poison and they live in your gut, so that's now in your gut. It's all the bacteria shit. That's really what it is. Okay, okay. So and it's bacteria. It's also yeast, fungus, mold, so all sorts of uh, stuff that could be in our gut. But it's and parasites sometimes, but it is, yeah, primarily it seems bacteria, exactly. And so the thing is, as well, you're like, oh, well, that sucks. Well, why don't we just uh, disinfect the whole digestive tract uh, so that doesn't happen? Yeah. The problem Take is, Take a bottle of activated all, charcoal. I should be good, right? <laughs> first, well, the activated charcoal helps to mop it up, but it doesn't really kill that stuff. Now, with, with antibiotics, they say, oh, you know, it's so bad if you're on antibiotics for a long time because it kills all the bacteria. It's actually not true. First of all, if it was true, then there'd only be one type of antibiotic. There are loads of types of antibiotics because different types kill different bacteria. Okay, so the problem is usually more that the bad bacteria, the ones that poo more poisonous stuff, are often stronger and more resilient. So if you take lots of antibiotics, um, it's killing the more fragile, maybe good ones, and it leaves behind only these bad poison pooers, mm. if that makes sense. So that's or that's more, one of the reasons why when you take antibiotics, so that, that might be the reason why when you take antibiotics, you sometimes get, your stomach just gets tore up in knots because you're actually killing all the good stuff and just leaving bad stuff afterwards. Yeah, it's not quite all or nothing, but it's like you're killing more of the good than the bad, and then the bad gets more of a you know dominant position in the whole uh, hierarchy, the whole ecosystem there. So, um, so, and I know, like, how does this relate to his then? Yeah, I was literally just quickly. thinking that I was going to say, I was like, this is interesting. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how this goes to slowing my stomach down, but, but I'm sure we're getting there. We're sure we're getting there. Yeah, almost, almost. So uh, it's really important that you, ha and as I said, it, it's not necessarily that you're eating poisons that feeds these bad guys and makes them produce more poison. You could be eating good stuff. You could be eating fiber and all that stuff that they tell you is good for you. Genetic Insights provides cutting edge, affordable DNA testing, giving you access to over 500 health reports that can help you in three key ways. They may be able to resolve your existing health challenges even when nothing else has worked. Using simple lifestyle changes, their reports can help you reduce your risk of developing future health challenges that you may be genetically predisposed to. And they can help you feel more confident in your health by showing you where you are genetically strong. Unlike most other genetic health testing companies, Genetic Insights tests over 83 million different variations in your genes, guaranteeing 99.7% accuracy across all of their DNA reports. They cover almost every aspect of health, including digestive issues, cardiovascular health, weight loss, hormonal and blood sugar balance, as well as nutrient needs, allergies and intolerances, and so much more. Using their system is quick and easy, and reading the reports is simple. If you've done an Ancestry DNA test, you can simply download your raw DNA data, upload it to the Genetic Insights platform, and within a few hours, you will have access to genetic reports which give you a risk score for each specific issue and scientifically validated recommendations based on your individual genetic profile. 
Everything in your reports are based on scientific studies and there are citation links throughout every report. If you are serious about optimizing your health and wellness and feeling great, then getting access to your genetic insights reports may be the most important health investment you will ever make. In the reports, not only will you gain insights into how to overcome existing health challenges and avoid future issues, you'll also discover which types of dietary, lifestyle, and even supplement protocols are best for your unique genetics. To get your unique genetic health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and use code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. That's geneticinsights.co using coupon code rejuvenate to get 20% off today. I guess I know, I'm going to encourage the, the derail. Well, like, how does this stuff enter into your body then? Like, if how are you getting the bad bacteria and stuff like that? It's just, just environmental factors. You're born with it. It could happen because you drank the long water in Mexico. Like, what what is this? Yeah, it can be that. It can be, you know, touching things and then putting your fingers in your mouth without washing your hands thoroughly enough. Uh, you know, pets, whatever. You know, a lot of people are touching stuff all the time, putting their things in their mouth. It could be in the food. The food is not 100% prepared properly. The contamination, you know. So living life, salads. basically. <laughs> so yeah, like exactly. Just living life. Okay. <laughs> and then some of them are actually meant to be there, but in very small quantities. And so then is the question is like, well, how do we suddenly have so many that they start to cause a problem? So now we're going back to Ozempic because one of the main things which causes a problem with that whole ecosystem of the digestive tract, we've already talked about antibiotics, that's one of them, but one of the, and, and a really bad diet would be another one because a really bad diet would tend to feed more of the bad ones than the good ones. But one of the other things which was much less focused on until recently, but is becoming way better known now. And this is, is again, mainstream medical science, even though it's, you know, not, not every doctor knows about it, but a lot of them do, and it's not contested, is that transit time is really important. So how long it takes to move through, meaning the longer the food takes to move through, uh, the more chance there is that um, it's going to rot and it's going to encourage... Uh, or it's going to ferment, maybe that's a better word to, to say, and then eventually rot. And it is going to encourage the overgrowth of these bad bacteria that create more poisons. Now, it's not to say that the quicker the better, because if it goes through too quickly, then your body can't absorb the nutrients. So if it's too quick, your body can't absorb nutrients. That's where with diarrhea, in a lot of poorer countries, people die of diarrhea because food keeps going through too quickly. The body can't hold those nutrients, they end up dying. So that's not good. But it's also definitely not the case of the slower the better because once it starts moving through too slowly, it's much more likely that more and more of it is gonna feed and encourage the growth of these bad bacteria. So there's this thing called SIBO. Have you heard of SIBO? I have heard of SIBO. I don't know why, okay. but I know I've heard of SIBO. <laughs> okay, uh, it stands for small intestine bacteria overgrowth. So we talk about the gut a lot, right? So in terms of where the food moves through, after it goes in the mouth, there's kind of three main areas. There's a the stomach, which I already mentioned with all the acid. Then it kind of goes past the liver and pancreas, but we don't have to worry about that. Then it goes into what's called the small intestine, which is this really long, thin, um, it's about uh, 30 foot long, it's got 150 corners. So incredibly convoluted, blah, 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 like spaghetti kind of thing. Yep, good old trap, and, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then once it's been through all of that, it gets the large intestine, which is called, it's actually way shorter, but it's like way um, uh, bigger circumference. Probably not even larger overall, but it's it's uh, a lot wider. Let's put it that way. Um, so anyway, the bacteria is supposed to be in the large intestine. That's part of the f it, like it ferments the fibers and stuff like that. Um, this is like a whole separate discussion about whether human beings were originally carnivores or herbivores or whatever. But anyway, we are the way we are. There's supposed to be some bacteria in the large intestine. They're supposed to do some stuff. They create some nutrients. They break some stuff down. Fine, but they're not really supposed to be in the small intestine, and the slower that transit time is, the more chance there is that bacteria will start to overgrow in the small intestine because it's not the only factor. A lack of stomach acid is also makes it more likely to happen because it means that the stomach hasn't killed all the bacteria that are naturally on the food. Um, but it's one of the reasons, if it's, if it's spending days and days in the small intestine instead of you know, 12 to 24 hours like it's supposed to be, it's much more likely to start to, uh, the bacteria that are naturally on the food will start to, the more and more and more of them creating more and more and more poison, which then also creates an immune reaction, 
which leads to inflammation th there, which can then become systemic. Then your whole body has inflammation, including in your arteries and your brain and all that. So all of that can start. All of these health problems, so inflammation in your brain, for instance, is one of the root factors of depression, anxiety, and, and more serious things, exactly, like Alzheimer's. Uh, inflammation uh, in your arteries, of course, is you know, the number one or number two cause of death in you know, most countries in the world, uh, you know, ultimately leading to heart attacks, strokes, uh, thrombosis, stuff like that. So all of that, again, I don't believe always does start there, but easily can start there just by food moving through too slowly. Those bacteria that are naturally there in very small quantities in food, having too much time to ferment and grow there, creating too many poisons, upsetting the immune system, interfering with nutrient digestion. So all of these problems can occur and they can all start just because it is moving to, the food is moving too slowly through the small intestine. There are various things that can make that happen. Eating bad like food which moves through the intestine really slowly, um, lack of hydration, um, uh, lack of movement is a big one. People who are sedentary all the time, people who breathe from their chest, not their bellies. There's loads of things that can potentially cause that problem. But you know what's really, really bad news? Purposefully taking the drug that massively slows down the process of how quickly all that food moves through the intestines. So going back to that, because I really want... Um, that sounds scary. I'm going to be honest with you. That doesn't sound awesome. But the one part, the thing that kept sticking in my head is I'm like, you mentioned like days getting through a small intestine, like rot, like it's fermenting. That's a process that takes time. Like statistically, or I don't know if they know, like how, how much, what percentage... And I don't know if you know this information, like how much is it really slowing it down? Because that also feels to me like that could be something that you say to be like, don't take it. This could happen. Well, yeah, sure, that could happen. But that could happen, like you said, in a lot of different ways. Uh, but if this is encouraging me to get, you know, get healthier, live healthier, be healthier and feel healthier. So I move more, um, which is going to help increase my digestion anyway. Do I avoid some of these things or is it slowing down so substantially? Sorry to pick on one element, but do you move more when you're on Ozempic? I mean, generally people feel like they have less energy because of how little... Well, I, I don't know. Know. I'm assuming if I could you know, shed some pounds, it'll be easier for me to get up, move around, not get so winded. And yeah, more, more like the, the, the weight loss encourages me to go out and move. Like I, you know, I want to put on my high school cross country jersey now and go start running again. Maybe having less weight to hold you down from getting up off the sofa or whatever, absolutely. But that's a big like movement at three hundred, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but the low energy, like you will generally experience low energy on a Zempic. Um, mm. And is that because of the food? You're not getting the energy from food normally, or is it something well, else? Well, let's. So sorry, that was my fault. Let's go back to the central point of what you said. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Sorry. Um, yes, I'm getting distracted. <laughs> but yeah, like how? How? What is that? Because I imagine there's got to be like you got to get real slow. Down? Yeah. Is it real? Because there's going to be a bridge where I could see the risk you're talking about would be like, holy shit, that's that's bad. But I kind of go back to, again, this is a proof drug that's freaking everywhere. So is it a function we're seeing a lot of outlier cases and other stuff, or does it really reduce it that much? I'll address the issue of it's everywhere, therefore it's good or okay separately. Yeah, we'll do that later. We'll get there the, later. Yeah. <laughs> let's talk about the slowness. Yeah, thing. the slowness for um, sure. Okay. So the truth is very little is actually known about the small intestine as it, within a living organism. So that's why the SIBO thing was only really discovered about 20 years ago. The medical establishment are very behind when it comes to the health of the small intestine. It's arguably the most important place for health, as we said, arguably, you know, believed by these ancient systems or whatever. And yet it's the least studied because it's very difficult to get to it. So if they think there's something going on in this large intestine, they shove a camera up there. That's called a colonoscopy. If they think there's something wrong with the stomach or even like the area after that, duodenum, they shove a camera down there, it's called an endoscopy. If there's something wrong with the small intestine, they can't really get to it. As I say, long, thin, loads of corners, right in the middle of this, you know, central thing. So the truth is they, they you know, it's hard to know for sure uh, what the average is, but I would say we can take a reasonable guess simply based on the calorie consumption. So a lot of people who start taking Ozempic, you know, especially as advised, or dosage of advised, um, will reduce their calorie consumption like by a lot. And I, I haven't seen the statistics for the average, um, but I believe it is something uh, like 50%. Um, I've, had, I've had people say they've reduced it by 70% as well. Now, even if I'm wrong, even if it's actually more like 30%, for instance, like overall with average and I'm 
you know, just looking at individual cases or whatever. Um, we could say that it would slow things down by that much. Does that make sense? Like if 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 you are eating that much less food, it's still um, it should be a ratio, uh, right? Like calories in, if it's moving slower, you're going to reduce that down, meaning the, the speed process should be, let's say, 30%, 30 to 50% more, like longer, right? So I guess then my next question to that is, like, what is the average time? And if it's 30 to 50% longer, what is, like, how does that increase the SIBO risk um, is kind of my thoughts. Because I still, that's that piece where I'm like, it sounds scary, but my brain's like, how can I really refine that risk? Is it really just something that is just sounding scary versus being scary? Um, yeah, I mean, is it huge? No, it's definitely not my only objection. Um, let's say it is, f you know, 30%, which is my best case scenario projection. Um, you know, how much more growth of bad bacteria? Uh, it may not be huge, but as I said, a lot of the time with the bacteria, it's like it's either it kind of in a healthy um what's the word peaceful balance with different organisms or it's been shifted into a bad balance like it's a it's more of a pathogenic dysbiotic state they call it dysbiosis so it doesn't actually have to be uh a, like it's true you know it, it's possible that if you're already very healthy and all other factors being equal and you are quite active and it's moving through quickly because you're quite active and you're eating the right foods, it's moving quite quickly because you're eating the right foods and all the rest of it, that that 30% or 50% or whatever it is wouldn't be enough to tip it over the edge from uh, healthy to dysbiotic. That's possible. And of course, there are some people who don't have problems. But the problem is a lot of people aren't eating the right foods. A lot of people are not very active, especially if they're overweight, which is why they're doing Ozempic in the first place. Um, if they're then also um slowing it down more by whatever it is 30 40 50 percent it can easily tip them over from being just about okay into dysbiosis the the estimates are that uh and this again as i said it's a fairly new science but the estimates are like maybe 30 plus percent of people are already suffering from SIBO anyway that this is like a significant factor um, for why so many people do have digestive issues so this is already a big problem and so the other thing is if you already have the issue and you have mild digestive issues you have a bit of bloating you have a bit of discomfort you have a bit of diarrhea constipation whatever it might be this is not going to help this is going to make it worse by slowing down the transit time however I have to say this is not my number one reason for not having it this is just like the the most obvious thing based on the mechanism that they say it works by which is slowing down the uh rate at which the, the stomach empties and food moves through the digestive system or, or the only reason i've focused on it so much is to say the thing that they say is what makes it works work is not a good thing slowing down that transit time is not a good thing however i don't actually think it's the biggest problem okay um yeah because i'll tell you even on that like a part of me is like oh that sounds not awesome but it also sounds in my brain and this is my brain it, i'm like but i could overcome that right like i could mitigate that risk i'm not that big you know like i'm you know where i might be overweight based on a bmi like i'm not you know i'm not in a bad situation so i could easily tell myself and I even as they're saying I was like I don't think that's that big of a risk for me it sucks I'd probably tell some other people hmm, get your shit re ready before you do it but I don't necessarily feel a risk but now what is the worst part tell me the part that I should actually be afraid of the worst part which is common well not just common the worst part that will definitely happen to you again as opposed to like there are issues like this the digestive system could become slow slow that it leads to pancreatitis this is one of the commonly you know claimed potential side effects of it and in fact if you have high risk for pancreatitis because it's in your family history and various other things then they may not give you ozempic you know so uh, there's um this thing called gastroparesis where your uh, stomach's ability to empty itself becomes paralyzed. And so like literally, you know, it can destroy your whole ability to you know, digest food either temporarily or perhaps not. Um, there's all kinds of, you know, wait, so it stops like your ability to digest food at all. It just stopped. So what do you do? You just throw it all up. Like what happens to food if you can't digest it? Well, if you get gastroparesis, you've got to then take medication to kind of force that process to some degree. Um, you know, it's a, very unpleasant debilitating condition depending on how serious it is i mean the paralysis can often be partial or it can be intermittent like you don't have it all the time and you know various things um uh, but yeah it, it can be very serious and life-threatening potentially but anyway as i said i won't focus too much on all that stuff because again i think other other people have and i know that if i were you i would be like eh, the chances of having that whatever they are 
one in 100, one in 1,000. It's not going to happen to me. Like, forget it. So let's talk about what definitely will happen to you. Okay, so my objection to Ozempic is, other than the fact that it seems like it's poisoning you, is actually really the same objection I have to um, all the strategies for losing weight that were the favorites before Ozempic came out, which would be... Keto, paleo, stuff like that, right? Well, more fasting and dieting, right? Like reducing the amount of calories that you take in one way or another, either by maybe not eating for most of the day, intermittent fasting. Um, I would say even, uh, or by, you know, doing a juice fast or whatever, like stopping fasting for a period of time would be another example of that. Now, you just said keto. Um, the, the thing about a ketogenic diet or, you know, a high carb diet, which is not as popular these days, but some people do it, like fruitarianism, for instance, is an example of a very high carb and low fat diet. There are other, you know, diets that have been around. Um, it's actually very easy to lose weight in most cases on a diet that's either extremely low in fat or extremely low in carbs. Because in both cases, like you get your calories from protein, fat, and carbs, but mainly really from fat and carbs. And it's so if you cut out totally or almost totally either of those, it's actually really hard to like overdo it with calories. Um, when you remove one of those completely. Because they're Does such big staples, sense? yeah. And so that's where you get... And they're so such imbal- And what you really do is create an imbalanced diet to accelerate a different type of caloric deprivation at that point in time. Because you know you're getting so much of that. Um, people gotcha. people say carbs makes you uh, gain weight, but I've, I've known lots of fruitarians. If you only eat fruit, you can have so many carbs... You can like, the fruit areas, they're literally eating fruit all day, every day. You, you'll see them. They're, mostly they're really skinny. Like they can't put on weight. Like, but that's because they're not having any fat. Ditto when you go on a ketogenic diet. Like you're having almost no carbs. You're trying to get all your calories from fat mainly and, and protein. Like a lot of the time the weight falls off of that because you're not allowing yourself any carbs. So all of these, what they all have in common is restriction of calories, either complete restriction in the case of fasting or restriction of a type of calories, a major type of calories in the case of the different diets you mentioned, Mm -hmm. right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but I would tell you, that's what I've always kind of been told too. And that's one of the reasons why I thought Ozemic made sense because everything I've always heard has always been the truest and best form of weight loss is just that caloric deprivation, just exert more calories than you ingest and you will inevitably lose weight. So I mean, for me, that that's that's where all those diets like, where I, I for me is always like, I am not going to put cream cheese and eggs in my coffee every morning and go, oh boy, you know, that just I can't do that forever. Like I, I want some balance, and I think if I had to eat fruit all the time and never have fat and protein, I would be even worse. That would be no fun at all. So, but that's always been my thing. But at the same time, I I, I get what you're saying. That caloric deprivation makes a ton of sense. But that seems like a positive for weight loss to me. I understand it would, yeah. But let me ask you this question. What is the long-term success rate of a calorie deprivation strategy in reality? You're always going to either, one, your body, you're going to starve yourself to a point that you're like, I can't do this anymore. And you're going to go back to previous eating habits and recidivism on your weight. Um, or you're going to hit you're going to hit a place where you can't continue. You got to do something else. You're going to hit a threshold of weight loss where whatever you're doing, it just it stops like a good example. My um, dad and stepmom, they've been on keto for way too long. Um, but they reached a point where they lost all this weight and then just stopped losing it. Haven't lost any weight since. And it's sent my stepmom into a weird spiral at times of just concern. Um, but, but it is like, there's a place where it doesn't, they keep trying, they keep doing it, but you just stop losing weight. There's just no more weight loss to happen. But that's the best case scenario. So I should have defined. So success means losing weight and keeping it off. So by that criteria of success, what is the success rate of a any kind of restrictive approach. I think it's pretty low. Most people don't sustain that behavior long enough, and then they just go right back before. And even you could argue in extreme cases that you go back worse. It's like the body yeah. will absorb So I'm going to get to that. Yeah. So my understanding is it's about 5%. So if you, try and lo- if you try and lose weight by restricting calories, it's going to be about a 5% success rate. Now, why? Why does it fail? And you already immediately went into you know, theories on that, which are the common mainstream theories. Um, You know, the reason for it, you said, is because people aren't sticking to it, right? Okay, so there's the question, why not? 
And then, you know, again, probably the usual mainstream theories are because they're lazy, because they're undisciplined, because of this. And this is what people say to themselves, right? Now, I am questioning all of that. As far as I'm concerned, that's all incorrect. The reason why um, the vast majority of people fail with that approach is not because they are lazy or undisciplined or whatever. It's because it is the wrong approach. It is the approach that is... Uh, going in exactly the opposite direction you're meant to. And so if you try eating, I don't know, salads for every meal or whatever, you know, cliche, maybe you have a little bit of lean meat or, you know, however people are doing it these days or just eating fruit, as I said, the fruitarians or whatever it might be, or eating no carbs or intermittent fasting, only having one meal a day, all of that kind of stuff, sooner or later, you don't stick to it, as you said. Why not? Now, the common understanding is you're not sticking to it because of a failing in you and discipline right discipline that's why it's always being undisciplined is the core yeah yeah the problem is not the strategy the problem is you and your application of the strategy that's what we're told now i believe that that is false the problem is that the strategy is fundamentally flawed i will explain why that is in a second but let me just introduce ozempic to this if i am wrong and there's nothing wrong with a the strategy, then Ozempic makes perfect sense because it forces you to stop eating more because it makes you either too sick to eat or too full to eat, right? So it seems like the per it is the perfect solution to the problem if the problem is actually discipline and willpower. But what if that's not the problem? And that's what I want to tell you about. So when you eat less, what happens, and you mentioned this right at the beginning, it slows down your metabolism. This could be if you eat less, you know, like periodically, like you're intermittent fasting, even if you're eating loads, you know, one meal a day or two meals a day or whatever. Um, this certainly happens if you eat less, you know, all throughout the day. So if you have less calories than before, like if you eat less um, or if you fast one week every few months or whatever, Every time you go into that phase of eating less, whether it's temporary or permanent or intermittent or whatever it might be, your body doesn't know you're doing that on purpose. If you look at all animals in the wild right now, their number one occupation, unless they're in mating season, is always food, getting enough food. In herbivores, so plant eaters, you see that because they are basically eating all day. If you ever see them like in, you know, in the wild again and you see like a lion or something taking out one of their friends, they look like worried and maybe run away. And then you know, within a few seconds, they're right back to eating yeah, grass yeah. or whatever it well, was. Well, Ted's like... dead, so let's just eat some more grass in his honor. More, more for us, yeah. <laughs> Basically. And that tells you how important it is to them to keep eating yeah. because... You know, it's literally, as as... you're right, it's pretty much the main function of all animals <laughs> <laughs> is to eat and have sex. Those are the two big things that they're going out and doing. And obviously there's stuff in between, but the main functions, it's just constantly food, 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 food. Uh, I know I watched like, I don't know if you ever watched this uh, show called Alone. It's when people are going and surviving by themselves in the woods. And it quickly makes you change and realize that like, yeah, you don't want to necessarily starve or one how hard things are just to go get food and keep your body going. Because we... It shuts down fast without food, much faster than I think we realize in our comfy little worlds where it's pretty accessible. Yes, exactly. And if you look at carnivores, again, when you watch nature documentaries, they usually show you know, the animal being successful when it's hunting. But nine times out of ten, a carnivore uh, fails in a hunt, depending on the animal, but let's say roughly overall. Um, and so like a carnivore, although they look cool and all the rest of it, it's just, it's a bad life. Like it's it's just feeling hungry almost all the time and having the, the only thing that you can eat constantly desperate to get away from you and evade you. Like it's not very fun life. So anyway, whether you believe we're descended from herbivores or carnivores, we seem to be some kind of combination. The point is we like fasting and, and eating less to lose weight is not a thing for any of our, you know, mammal or animal, like, friends. And it's not a thing for our body. Hmm. Does that make sense? Like, that, that this, this idea... Now, I know that there's a bit of a history of doing it, like, in a religious context, like fasting in order to have visions and stuff like that. Fine. But I'm saying for, you know, the vast majority of our evolution and of our history and of our time... 
if we were ever to restrict our food, it might be for religious or spiritual reasons, but it was never for health reasons. You know, it was never to lose weight specifically because there was always this problem for the vast majority of our ancestors, the vast majority of time that there wasn't enough food. And so if we are eating less than we want, our body assumes we are not doing it because we're choosing to, it assumes we're doing it because we have to. Does that make sense? No, it makes sense. So it's a, it creates a stress response in the body, I'd imagine. But I think the antithesis of that, I guess the counterpoint to that is where I could agree. But I also feel like a lot of the times, you know, that was a real fear for our bodies back in that time frame that it didn't feel. I know there's periods and obviously societies that had food abundance. I'm not saying that there weren't times in ancient history where there were yeah. societies. That so had, I say most of the time. Yeah, yeah. Most of the time for most people. Yeah, yeah, but like, but I think there are also lots of times where like food was incredibly scarce and it mattered so much. And there would be times pretty regularly where some of these religious practices were built more out of a function to extend the food supplies, right? How do we create a way that people stop eating so we don't have to feed them as much? And you could kind of extend that out. Like some of that became like a necessary evil, right? To, to essentially help people survive. But now we live in an area where, again... There's the your skepticism again. Maybe it was a big con and it was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, it's like, but, but let me go back to metabolism, all right? So you mentioned that word earlier, metabolism. What is metabolism? So here's the thing. Your body functions perfectly in an optimal way when your metabolism is at a certain level. What does metabolism mean? Metabolism is basically the speed at which a lot of different functions happen in your body, and it's related to the amount of energy available to all those different functions will determine that speed to a large extent. And one of the simple ways we can see this is in temperature, body temperature. So if you are 37 or 98.6, which is you know the, the US equivalent, I think, most of the world uses the other one. Um, that means that your metabolism is probably in a pretty optimal condition and every process in your body has a pretty optimal amount of food for day-to-day -day functioning. Now, if that's optimal, then why do we have the ability to speed up or slow down our metabolism from an evolutionary point of view? Well, one answer is obvious. Um, if we get a fever, you know, if you get a high temperature, what does that mean? It means you're ill, right? That's one of the things they'll do, if, you know, with your kids, right? They say they've got a stomachache, like, Check let me see if you're faking or not. Yep. Check the temperature, right? So, um, now, why does the temperature go up when you're ill? Because when you're facing an emergency, and it actually doesn't only happen with, um, like, an infection. It actually happens if you're poisoned as well. So, if you literally, if I give you arsenic or any kind of poison. Or ozempic. Your metabolism. <laughs> <laughs> Not Ozempic, <laughs> yeah. uh, but maybe some of the ingredients they add with the Ozempic, that's what I'm saying, the phenol. Um, when, uh, when you give your body a poison, uh, something that recognizes the poison, especially that's part of the problem with all the poisons they've invented in the last 100 years that the body hasn't adapted, it hasn't worked out what it is yet, but for all the traditional poisons that have been around a long time, um, and anything it recognizes the poison, and anything it recognizes as infection, um, it speeds up metabolism to go, this is an emergency, we're going to mobilize more energy to deal with this. And so there's, you know, plenty of studies showing that even a moderate increase in body temperature will substantially increase the speed of function, therefore the effectiveness of the immune system, which is one reason why saunas and stuff like that. I was just going to say, yeah, idea. saunas to do in the hot cold, um, that, that, that increase in your body temperature could help purge and effectively increase your metabolism. So, but being that, that so being though that, that it can be variable, um, it seems like, you know, so even if you might do damage with fasting or slowing that down for weight loss, you could still speed it back up again, too. Like, so it's it's got that variability built in. Well, let me get to that. So in the case of a poison, including an infection, it will speed it up temporarily, right? So if you go from 98.6 to 100, that's generally considered to be a problem, which is about, I think, 37.7, right? It doesn't have to be that much higher than it's like, oh, there's something wrong, right? But if you go down the same amount, if you go down from 98.6 to, uh, let's say, 97.2, that would be the exact same reduce, reduction, or 36.3 from the rest of the world. Um, if you go into a doctor and you say, I'm 36.3 or I'm 97.2, they'll say, so. They don't care at all, even if it's a bit lower. So, you know, if you go to a doctor and you say, I'm 101, they're definitely going to say, okay, it looks like you're ill. You know, even if they only advise bed rest and fluids or whatever. Uh, if you go in saying I'm 96.2, they still don't care. Yeah, they don't give like, a 
I've even asked him before, like, how cold is too cold? And I I don't remember the answer. I was like, at what point, like, am I just a dead body coming in here? Like, how how low could you even go? Um, I don't, I think I've even gotten a firm answer. I think they said something, but it it did not seem much of a concern. I think the US is 93 or something, but it's hypothermia. That's what they classify it as. It's when it gets to what they call hypothermia. Now, here's the thing. So if it's sped up, the reason why it's a problem it's not a problem, but it's a sign of a problem. It's a sign that your body's dealing with something that it has to speed up to deal with it. But if you reduce your calorie intake, your body doesn't know you're doing that on purpose. It assumes that there's not enough food. And so the reason we have the ability to slow down our metabolism is because throughout our history, we've had at least periods, maybe just the winter, you know, even in an abundant environment, where we had a lot less food available. And so we had to kind of go into at least a semi-hibernation mode where everything slowed down. And all the things we wanted to do, let's say, you know, um, the, the, all the what I call luxury functions of the body, like the digestive system, the immune system, the detoxification system, the endocrine system, which includes your hormones. The body's like, you know what? We can survive for a while with low testosterone. We can survive for a while with reduced immune function. We can survive for a while with that poison there. We don't have to go to a lot of effort because we have a small amount of energy. We're just going to focus on the core functions. We're just going to focus on the things that keep you alive and we're not going to do any of the things that optimize you. And so the problem with calorie restriction on an ongoing basis that something like Ozempic not only encourages, like a diet might encourage it, but actually forces on you is that you will be in that calorie restricted state all the time. And so you will be in that slow metabolism state all the time. That means you're basically in a um, situation of subclinical, meaning not bad enough for a normal doctor to recognize it, but bad enough that any doctor who focuses on optimizing you will recognize it, hypothyroidism, low thyroid function. And what are the classic signs of low thyroid function? They are depression and anxiety, weight gain, weight gain, yep, yep. <laughs> Slowed, slowed digestive function, often called constipation. That's like the end of the process. Um, and Brain uh, issues galore, you know, brain fog. All brain that fog, stuff, yeah. lack of mental clarity. Or the other side that people can go into a stress response. Like they're like, oh my God, I can't be so you know foggy or whatever. I'm going to spike my adrenaline to be able to cope. Um, and so uh, uh, reduced immune function being one of the biggest ones. So either all the allergies and tolerances, all that kind of stuff, or chronic infections, the immune system just can't deal with it, whether it's skin infections, whether it's toenail functions, whether it's gum infections, whether it's urinary tract infections, whether it's sinus infections, all of that kind of stuff. And so that's really common these days. And it's really common these days to have a slow metabolism. So I would say the epidemic of weight gain in this country, my country, your country, a lot of the world, is caused by the metabolism already being too slow. The average person these days is already 36 or 97 rather than 37 or 98.6. They, they're even like 100 years ago, people used to be able to consume 4,000 calories a day easily. These are studies that I've seen where this is the average uh, uh, consumption rate. They used to have a lot of sugar um, and they used to have a lot of saturated fat. They used to have a lot of animal fat. They used to have a lot of meat. They didn't exercise. The idea of exercise as a thing you do for your health was kind of invented in the 60s in California. 100 years ago, it didn't exist. Now, people did sports. People did work, jobs where they had to move around. Yeah, a lot more physical labor, not not (laughs) Zoom labor, right? But not not necessarily, you know, we're not talking a 1,000 years ago. 100 years ago, there were still plenty of people with desk jobs, even then, even though there were less of them. Um, And yet, obesity barely existed. And funnily enough, 100 years ago, the average temperature was 98.6, which is where all that stuff was founded. Now, we have an epidemic of people having a lower core temperature. We have an epidemic of obesity. We have an epidemic of digestive issues. We have an epidemic of allergies and uh, intolerances. Um, We have an epidemic of skin issues. We have an epidemic of depression. We have an epidemic of, you know, uh, uh, reduced uh, cognitive function. If you look at the, for instance, the diction, the ability to think clearly, if you see tests that they were giving kids 100 years ago. So basically, every sign of slowed metabolism, we have an epidemic of in this country. And weight gain is only one of them. So, and, 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 and by the way, 
uh, 100 years ago, one of the blood tests that they had back then, which would indicate to someone that they had low thyroid function and slow metabolism, metabolism was high cholesterol. And so if they saw you had high cholesterol, they saw you had a tendency to gain weight, especially water weight, puffiness, and all the other symptoms I've already mentioned now twice, I won't do them all again. If they saw you had all that, they would support your thyroid until you got to a level where your metabolism was normal again, at the level it should be. Instead, what we do is they say, okay, you got depression, here's an anti-depression drug. You got, you got anxiety, here's an anti-anxiety drug. Uh, you got high cholesterol, here's an anti-cholesterol drug. If you've got um, uh, skin issues, here's a cortisone cream or whatever. If you've got a chronic infection, here's some antibiotics. If you've got allergies, here's an antihistamine. Do you see, they're treating every single symptom. And you know, in the 60s, it was like diet pills, like basically based on amphetamines, which is why I used that thing earlier. That's not a crazy idea to give people amphetamines to lose weight. No, no. I, mean, I remember nasal sprays were amphetamines that everyone used in the 20s and 40s. Like, this is great for making me just go lose weight and have all sorts of energy. And I don't have the FDA yeah. and, and the medical profession were routinely prescribing amphetamines to, you know, housewives and, and mothers and all the rest of it to lose weight as recently as the 1960s. Um, so basically what I'm saying is, uh, and, and there's conspiracy fears around this. Could it be that they make a lot more money by giving all these drugs that work for all these different symptoms, Ozempic just being the latest version, but arguably, you know, at least one of the most dangerous. I mean, it's hard to say because they're all pretty dangerous. Everything that I just mentioned is dangerous to various degrees. Lowering cortisol is dangerous, sorry, lowering cholesterol is dangerous because cholesterol is the thing that all your steroid hormones are made out of, like testosterone and progesterone, all the things that actually make you feel good. Um, you know, uh, um, I won't go through all of them. You know, SSRIs are dangerous, that's known these days, but all of that kind of stuff. So rather, so to me, Ozempic is another example of treating the symptom rather than actually the cause. And now, is this just a theory? No. My experience shows again and again that if you get a person's metabolism optimized and you get their temperature to be consistently around 37, 98.6, um, they can eat three, 4,000 calories a day, depending on their size, barely exercise and not put on a pound of weight. So, so this is my question for you. It, you know, would you prefer taking a drug, which in your country costs a lot of money, will probably make you feel sick very day for several days, will potentially, uh, you know, create all kinds of other serious side effects, will definitely slow down your metabolism and leave you feeling colder, um, will uh, not resolve any of the other core issues that you may also suffer with. You know, we won't go into that because this is not a consultation. Yeah, but right. <laughs> I have no issues, you also, I'm perfect. I don't <laughs> maybe you also suffer from digestive issues. Maybe you also suffer from feeling cold. Maybe you suffer from depression. Maybe you suffer from all these things. So not only will it not help with any of these other issues, it will actually make it worse because by taking a Zempic, you'll be keeping your metabolism slow and even if you try and do other things to speed up your metabolism, maybe you're trying to exercise because you heard that speeds up your metabolism, or you're trying to take supplements to speed up your metabolism, like 7-keto DHEA or whatever whatever you've heard of. Like, But none of that worked because the fundamental thing that drives your metabolism, um, assuming that you don't have a hormonal issue like with your thyroid, the fundamental thing that drives your metabolism is how much and how often you eat. And if, if you eat... Even the intermittent fasting thing, even if you have a lot of calories, even if you have 3,000 calories a day, but you wake up and you spend hours and hours and hours and all you have is coffee or something and you don't eat for hours, again, that tells your body that there's a starvation situation going on and it still slows down your metabolism. When you're actually healthy and you're actually, your metabolism is firing optimally, you wake up and you feel hungry straight away and you eat and you eat every few hours, you don't snack in between. And look, I can say for myself, I was underweight before because of my own digestive issues. Uh, I'm now 84 kilos. I don't know what it is, 180 pounds. I'm six foot three. I consume 4,000 calories a day. I have plenty of carbs. I have plenty of saturated fat. Um, and the only exercise I do currently is walking. Uh, so really not much. And I do not put on any weight. And uh, you know, I had experience with uh, someone on Ozempic who's very close to me. Um, they took Ozempic, they went from 160, cal uh, 160 pounds down to 140 pounds. Great. They stopped taking it. A few months later, they put all the weight back on. I then got them on 
uh, metabolism optimizing strategy, including eating regularly, making sure not to skip breakfast, eating the right foods for them, which is no deprivation. They're still eating all the fun stuff, all the tasty stuff. Um, but just eating it, you know, like in the right way, making sure you have a balance of macros with every meal, making sure you don't skip meals, making sure you don't skip breakfast, um, and then optimizing the thyroid function. And again, that like they lost the weight again. So both systems worked. The Ozempic worked to lose the weight and go down to 140 pounds. The thyroid optimizing, metabolism optimizing worked to lose weight to go down to 140 pounds. But the difference is, with the metabolism optimizing, their energy is better, their mood is better, their digestion is better, their allergies are gone, um, and they're happy, <laughs> and they don't feel poisoned every week, um, and they are able to eat whatever they want, yeah. basically. Yeah, I mean, obviously not e everything, I'm sure. There's things you probably still still want to avoid, but I want to go back to something. Uh, like, uh, they, they eat burgers, they eat ice cream, they eat potato chips. Like, I, I'm saying, when your, when your metabolism is optimized... Like, or you know, people I guess say, like, like teenagers, right? Like, that's teenagers. They feel exactly. like they could eat anything and they just, they, it's like nothing happened. Yeah, it just goes right out their system and they're living the best life. So, as my son recently, who just turned 15, um, ate a pound of ravioli last night on his own and just was fine an hour later. And I was like, I don't even know what to do with that. That would be, I, I would not feel that way. That's for sure. So now um, I do want to bring up something because there's one part that's kind of sticking stick my craw a little bit because uh, I have really enjoyed intermittent fasting. That's been one that for me, um, it really worked and it made me feel a lot better when I started doing it, not just from a weight loss perspective, but a feeling perspective. So I'm curious on that because for me, like... Are you skipping breakfast? By any uh, yeah, breakfast and lunch. I pretty much have one meal a day, so I'm just eating um, later in the window. But for, for me, it's that has honestly helped my mental clarity a lot more. My energy levels feel a lot better. I feel more engaged throughout the day. And it's almost now something where, like, sometimes I'll have a lunch, um, but it, it's right after that. I feel so bogged down, and it feels very inefficient to do that kind That's of stuff. That's a great question. And it's great. I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of people feel that way. So I just want to say, first of all, fair enough. I'm not going to deny anyone's lived experience. That's what happens for you. That's what happens for you. It happens for many people. In fact, it is common and typical what you're saying. But again, what else is common and typical in this day and age? Allergies, intolerances, chronic infections. Obe Do you see what I mean? Like it goes hand. But anyway, so does it go hand in hand? Edwin? Well, let me t tell you why I think it does. Because... Energy should come from food. Should come from food. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's what we're taught at school, right? Food contains calories. Calories are energy. Okay, okay. So if eating makes you have less energy, something's wrong there. Does that make sense, theoretically? I, I okay. would think so, yeah. But it sure feels that way, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it feels that way uh, in the same way that, you know, let's say... Uh, a, a natural food should be good for you, but if you have an allergy to it, it's going to feel very bad for you, right? So, again, I'm not denying a person's experience. If they eat, I don't know, lettuce and they have an allergic reaction, I'm not saying, you know, lettuce is good for them. But what I'm saying is you should be able to eat lettuce without having an allergic reaction, ideally, if you're optimally healthy. Does that make sense? And so the same thing. So you should be able to eat food and feel energized by the process and if you do not that's a sign of there being something wrong so there are two basic types of energy that a person can run on you can either run on real energy which in science is defined as atp adenosine triphosphate this is cellular energy this is you have little energy factories inside almost every cell of your body um, and they they make energy out of for simplicity's sake food plus air right so so that is one way that you should make energy. And that, from my point of view, is the correct way in the vast majority of situations. Now, what if there isn't enough food around? Or what if you need so much energy in this moment that food doesn't give you enough? I imagine you can go to your so, adrenals at that point, right? You're going to tap into there for Exactly. Energy. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the other energy source is, so adrenaline will... Um, uh, adrenaline, cortisol, these stress chemicals, they will raise up, your body will mobilize energy from storage, it will redistribute the energy, so it will go 
towards the survival functions, like you mentioned mental clarity, it will go towards the lungs, it will go towards the muscles, it will go towards the heart. So you'll be able to function, you'll be able to do your job, you'll be able to run a race. But it will take energy away from your digestive system, from your immune system, from your cellular detoxification system, from your endocrine system, and so uh, from some functions in your brain. And so that's why maybe later you feel more unhappy, you feel more anxious, um, you're more likely to have skin issues, you're more likely to have allergies, you're more likely to have intolerances, you're more likely to, you know, over time build up toxicity until it reaches a point where it's a serious disease, you're more likely to have, you know, all of those kind of issues. So things are looking so great. You feel, yeah. <laughs> you feel better in the moment, but it's because you've robbed Peter to pay Paul. In the same way as when you're poor, I spent a lot of my early life very poor, when I got a credit card um, that with a large <laughs> spending limit, suddenly... I was able to easily meet my weekly expenses and I felt a lot better. But it wasn't actually resolving the problem. All it was doing is digging me into more and more debt that at some point I was going to have to get out of. Some so future pain was waiting for thing. you at some point in time. Yes. So if you wake up and you have, you know, a coffee or something to, cr to stimulate the adrenals rather than eating, what you're doing, or you don't even have to have a coffee. You can literally just not eat. That's all that's required. Your body's going to increase the stress chemicals. Now, I think everyone knows these days, cortisol, when it is high for a long time, is not good. It creates premature aging. And you know what are the other side effects of long-term high cortisol? Wait, yeah. <laughs> so we're back to that again. Yep. So again, it's it, yes, it does make you feel better in many cases, especially if you have a certain body type. And we, we are all different based on genetics. And I will admit, based on genetics, it's a strategy, like intermittent fasting is a strategy that suits some more than others, it is true. But the overall long-term consequences are pretty much the same for everyone. Your body goes into a survival state. Um, it down it, it uh, down-regulates the amount of energy available to all non-essential, non-survival functions, which creates lots of problems long-term. Um, and uh, it slows down your metabolism, ultimately. Your metabolism is sped up by adrenaline, but as soon as the adrenaline wears off, you're going to go back to it being slowed down. So depending on how strong you are, depending on all the other health stuff, depending on the genetics you've been given, you can get away, for it, get away with it for a certain point. Uh, I think you're on your 30s, Kyle. So, you know, many people of your age, they can still get away with it. This is the whole thing. You know, when, you, when you're, you know, back to the teenager thing, when you're in your early 20s, most of the time, other people are so unhealthy these days because these problems have compounded. But, you know, the cliche is when you're a teen or in your early 20s, you can, you know, have a uh, drink all night, have three hours sleep, get up, you're feeling fine. Like, you know, <laughs> and then people in that position be like, oh, there's nothing wrong with alcohol. I, I had 10 pints last night. I woke up today, I felt fine. <laughs> but it's how sustainable is it that's the question. And it's always better to review these things before it's too late, before you've already had a serious health crisis, before you've already had a collapse, before you've already had a breakdown. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. You know, it's interesting because I will say that the other part that I was listening to this is like, well, it feels like you're telling me to live like a sheep and not like a lion. <laughs> at, at the end of the day, like, I, I will say, like, it's... Not necessarily. And sorry, just to clarify that, like, uh, some people definitely are more carnivore-like and some people more herbivore-like genetically. Um, but again, I'm, I'm saying if you are truly the king of the jungle and you're doing really well and you're part of a successful pack... Are you fasting all the time? No, like you're eating regularly, right? <laughs> you got a carcass lying there. You wake up, 
hungry, you go and eat it. Right? Yep, and Until then go out full. and hunt and, and <laughs> still have that mentality. But So I'm saying, yeah. like, if you try, if you identify more of lion than sheep, I'm saying live like a successful lion, not a, <laughs> not not a loser a bear, lion. Yeah, not a, yeah <laughs> struggling to get by lion. No loser lions here. <laughs> you know, th- that is really interesting because I, I, I think for me, like, I, I still have to, I have to be honest with you. There's a part that kind of just, I, I feel like I need to do more research because you really are going completely against, I feel like everything I've structured weight loss around, which is this idea of caloric deprivation. In fact, I've always said like at the end of the day, like all these diets, it just comes down to the only way if you want to lose weight. In my mind has always been caloric deprivation. We'll call it the lion method, right? Like the loser lion method as we coined it. But like, like yeah, that still feels... And that's what's pushed out. I think it brought a lot of interesting things, but a lot of this still kind of comes back to this, this idea. Let me address like, that in a couple of ways. Yeah. All right. So first of all, um, if a strategy has a less than five percent success rate, like does that mean it may not be a good strategy? That's the first thing to ask yourself, even before you do any research, just conceptually, right? Um, and again, like I know that also there's the thing about oh, well, everyone's not doing it right. But again, if a strategy is so difficult that less than 5% of people can do it right? Isn't, it shouldn't the question be, isn't there a better strategy that more people would be able to do right? I mean, like, isn't that my, a question my question would be asking? like, hey, what, what are the other options percentages, right? So if, if I'm looking at something that's only 4% successful, but everything else in that success range is two, um, then I'm like, yeah, I'll take 4%. So I think there's all relative to what you're looking at. But sure. I but, think you do bring the question said, of like, like, man, shouldn't there be a better way if all we're hoping for is 4% success. And I can't sit here and tell you that, no, I, I, I think we should accept 4% success. No, no, we, we should accept more. But I'm not a utopian, right? This is not like some fancy, like, it's, it, I, I believe it would be possible. If, no, no, I'm talking about your great-grandparents, my great-grandparents 100 years ago, they were having more calories and they were not obese and no one about them was obese. So this is not some distant, maybe one day dream. This is actually normal. You know, I don't know what your ancestors were, but you know, I think mine had a relative food abundance other than the Second World War, where there was a bit of rationing and whatever. So um, any of your ancestors who had food abundance, and there was food abundance in the US and the UK 100 years ago, um, they, were, they had already achieved this. We have actually regressed from that point. So that's the first point. Second point I want to make, which I really believe proves this point is this. So the main thing that controls how fast your metabolism goes, other than how, how much and how frequently you eat, which I've already covered in detail, is the thyroid gland. A lot of people's thyroid is just too slow. A lot of the time it's actually caused by all these diet stuff, but there's more to it. There's genetic factors, there's toxicity factors, there's other factors. If you give a person, quote unquote, too much thyroid gland, too much thyroid medication, or and this is not very common, but if they happen to have a situation where their thyroid gland is already overactive, that's, that's called hyperthyroidism. And so when you're hyperthyroid, your metabolism is too quick, your core temperature is too high, you kind of like have a close to a fever or a fever all the time. Those people, medically documented, no one questions it, no matter how much they eat, they cannot gain weight or in many cases even hold on to weight. So to me, this proves the whole point. If you just take enough thyroid, and I'm not saying you should, and it is dangerous and don't do it, but if you do, you can look at the medical literature for this, it is impossible to keep weight on no matter how much you eat. So that to me proves that it is merely and simply a matter of metabolism. Now, the weight... If it's so obvious, why doesn't everyone? Yeah, really I mean that was a really really good thing. It's like so, <laughs> you know, you're bringing it up and it's like, hey, this sounds really interesting. But the internet has taught me, and YouTube has taught me, an interesting argument does not make a fact, right? So there, there's a lot of good well, logic. What I said is about. a fact. No, I understand what you're saying. Like I'm saying, like, but this the word you can see how hyperthyroidism that also comes to a lot of other health conditions. And where I think there's some interesting arguments. Um, you know, at the same time, why have we saddled ourselves with caloric deprivation? I know you brought up some stuff, but it feels like we should be talking about more of like a real epidemic of a lot of these conditions. And I feel like we're not at all. And, and again, we might argue that it's it's monetary, but I, I we really don't, don't have an epidemic of these conditions. What was that? We don't have an epidemic. We don't have an epidemic. No, no, no. I, I, I'm saying like it's not talked about in that way. I feel like I'm not hearing people talk about it as an epidemic of conditions. I feel like maybe it's more probably because 
it's an epidemic of one issue to what they talk about, not all of them collectively. That could be probably why. Yeah, they just don't combine them together, but there is a lot of talk about an epidemic of all the conditions I talked about, right? There's an epidemic of depression compared to before, there's an epidemic of obesity compared to before, there's an epidemic of low sex drive and hormonal issues compared to before, there's an epidemic of um, uh, allergies and intolerances compared to before, right? At least those four, these are, you know, frequently talked about. We haven't even talked about the serious diseases, which I think ultimately are a consequence of this, but I'll, I'll leave that out. <laughs> Just talking about weight loss. Um, so, uh, yes, but here's the thing. Medical, the medical establishment likes to define things in very binary terms, meaning it's like you either have it or you don't, right? Um but reality is more of a continuum. It used to be the case like with, uh, you know, these days they don't say you do have autism, you don't, they say it's the autism spectrum. spectrum. Yeah. It's a spectrum, right. So that's actually true of a lot of stuff. It's true with obesity, right? I mean, beyond a certain point, they say you're obese, below that point, you're not obese. But the truth is, it's not actually binary. I don't know what, I don't know what the limit is, but let's say for your height, it's not like when you were 199 pounds, you weren't obese, and now you're 201 pounds, you are obese. Like, I mean, technically, but do you see what I mean? It's continuing. No, no. Well, like, I remember at, at my in BMI standards, like, I think I'm close to obese already on my natural weight, right? Just, like, the way I walk around. But I just have a very heavy lower half. Like, I just have very stumpy horse legs. So um, there's, like, I'm supposed to be, like, 100 and I think 45, 155 pounds. I haven't been that since I was – a like 15 years old. And so I have no idea how I'd ever get to that level without severe things. You know what I mean? But I, I, I get what you're saying. Like me at one, me at one ninety is considered obese, but that is not the same as somebody, me at 280 pounds that would look very different and be very different. But technically both are just the same obese. Yeah. I was more saying that the line between obese and not obese is kind of arbitrary, that it's actually a continuum. Um, and actually, I, I, I do appreciate that tangent, though, because let me bring that up for a second. One of the other mainstream criticisms of Ozempic, which I think is 100% accurate and actually is accurate for calorie restriction in general, is uh, it's not necessarily fat you lose. It's just as much muscle. And I've actually seen studies that show it's more muscle that you lose rather than fat. So, again, the obsession with weight, I think, is also incorrect. You know, what you really want, actually, for health is muscle to fat ratio. And so does the weight loss that results with Ozempic lead to a better muscle to fat ratio? From what I've seen, the studies actually say, no, it does not. And in many cases, it actually makes it worse. Now I'll agree so with you on that because I don't think I've life. seen anybody from Ozempic not look a little bit like a, like at the end of the day, kind of a little kind of skin ghosty you know what i mean like when people lose weight too fast a marathon runner the week before you start to get really gaunt a little bit um so i just always assume, honestly i just assume that's this when you lose weight too fast you get a little saggy sometimes um but it can almost age no, it's you. the way you're doing but it's, it's the it, way okay and some people do avoid it by having like loads of protein and loads of resistance training and stuff like that but generally if you're just living like a normal person and you're uh, doing a Zen pick and restricting calories, then yeah, you're going to lose just as much or more muscle than fat. So that's not good either. But to go back to my spectrum point, because I'm almost done with this, they treat it as if you're either hypothyroid, like your, your metabolism's too slow, or you're hyper, it's definitely too fast, or you're fine. Those are the three categories. But that's not reality. The reality is you could be perfect, you could be slightly less than perfect, slightly more than perfect, a bit more less than perfect, a bit more, and then eventually it gets to the point where it's, so bad they classify it as too slow or so bad they classify it as too fast. But my point was from optimal, if you were a bit the fast end of optimal, like a bit too fast metabolism, you don't have to be full on hyperthyroid to be in a situation where no matter how much you eat, the, the weight falls off you. You know, in, in re research groups I'm a part of, people who keep their temperature, you know, like more like 99 or like something like that, they're in that position of, being able to eat so many calories every day and the weight just doesn't go off. Uh, sorry, the, the weight just doesn't go on no matter how much they eat. So um, just, and, and this is a level of, you know, if you, as, as we said earlier, if you go to a doctor and they measure your temperature, it's 99. And like, you know, there's not, there's not something medically to worry about. So I wasn't suggesting that people go into full on hypothyroidism because that is dangerous and can lead to heart problems and all the rest of it. But I'm saying if you are just a little bit on the, 
fast end of optimal rather than slow end of optimal, which is what most people are at best, you can be in that position where you just don't get it in weight. And in terms of why is this not mainstream knowledge, the other question that you asked, um, I would have to go down the conspiracy route. I would have to say there is too much money to be made from selling people things that they have to take for the rest of their life for every symptom rather than actually addressing the root cause. Now, so, I mean, I have to admit, sometimes I get that in America, if I'm being honest with you. It does feel like there's a, a medication for everything at all times um, that isn't solving things, especially in depression. I see it a lot there. Um, but, like, how's that for other countries? It feels like, a, I should just say this, it, the, the problem feels much more beyond America, maybe the worst here, but still somewhat of a problem around diets and things like that internationally. So it, do you think that is it a global conspiracy? That feels like it gets a little bit too tin, tin hatty for me. If you read the book, The Real Anthony Fauci by uh, our, our Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who's currently running for president at the time of uh, us uh, you know, filming this, he does a great job of showing. And I, I think he's an extremely public figure. He spent decades suing the government and all kinds of corporations. Um, he has a lot of money and wealth behind him. So if there were anything he was saying in that book that were not true, he would definitely get sued for it. Um, that hasn't happened. He provides, you know, thousands and thousands of citations for everything he says. Anyway, he describes in great detail how uh, really the world's uh, medical consensus is created and maintained from a centralized position. And a lot of it goes down to funding. So there is a big overlap between the biggest governments, of which the US is the biggest, and the biggest pharmaceutical companies. When I say overlap, it's like the head of one, the head of the pharmaceutical company then goes and is the head of the regulatory agency that's supposed to oversee the pharmaceutical company and back again. Um, but yeah, how does that apply across the entire world? Uh, well, then um, it's, it's a control of funding. Um, and any any dissident voices, and we all saw this during COVID, and I, I'm not going to comment on this too much because I don't want to kick, get kicked off this channel, but we all saw during COVID, even the most respected, peer-reviewed, Harvard-educated, whatever it might be, as soon as anyone steps up who has a narrative which is counter to the narrative, which is approved by those who set narratives, the response is brutal, right? They are deplatformed, they are demonetized, they are, the funding is pulled, they, their credibility is ruined, like everything is taken away from them. So in most cases, it's simply a position where everyone, all the research scientists throughout the world know, if I go into an area that I'm not supposed to, I will not get funding. And if I'm really vocal about it, then I'll have everything taken away from me at best. And then there's all you know other kind of things about you know, assassinations and disappearances and this and that and the other. But the vast majority of people probably, I mean, that's a very small amount and that's not that common. It's just simply through, look, you like being a scientist? Yeah. Well, then you better toe the line. You know, it's really as simple as that. Well, and the scientist world is so competitive, right? Like there's really not that many scientists or researchers in those realms that have access to a lot of money and prestige. So those, no, those positions get very controlled. all someone else for funding. Yeah, and so yeah. It, it gets very controlled. And so yeah, new ideas oftentimes get pushed out just because it challenges the very limited seats of power held in those science worlds. So that's interesting, man. I, honestly, like I was feeling pretty damn confident about Ozempic at the beginning of this because it seemed, but I knew there was something off. Um, and I'm not sure I'm not totally unsold about it, but I will tell you that I, I feel like I need to look a lot more, especially in this idea of the, the metabolism, the slowdown, and really rethinking caloric deprivation because that's always been, again, like my staple of weight loss. Like anytime I feel like I'm even getting a little bit too tight in the waistband, I'll just go to some sort of, you know, a fast or a caloric deprivation period, which, which gets the job done. But you're right, it's not a permanent solution. Um, it's more of a reciprocal thing that I'll do every now and again or think, oh, I was doing something I shouldn't have. Let me just trim it out, right? So a lot of this has come back from, I told you, a vacation where we didn't have access to food we normally like. And I think I gained 15 pounds over a vacation. Um, but, you know, I've been doing some caloric deprivation things and, um, you know, dropped 10 pounds in a couple of days. So it's like, get me right back to where I want to be. Um, but 
it makes me feel like maybe that might be the wrong route of this deprivation. It's been working, but has it right at the same time? Because there is a little bit of a yo-yo that can occur um, through periods of bad behavior. So, um, yeah, yeah. And without sort of revealing anything personal, you've had a lot of the signs of low metabolism, right? This is something that's already happened to you and you're not alone, right? We don't have to say anything personal, but again, over 50% of the population have experienced those things uh, and do experience them on an ongoing basis. So again, you know, uh, if the thing that you're following is not working for you or almost anyone else around you, then Why I'd say it's worth questioning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I really appreciate that, man. I, I know, um, I know I don't want to take too much more of your time after this, but, um, I, I honestly it just gave me a lot to think about. I felt pretty like, ah, you know, we're, we're going to be good here, but that I'm going to have to go talk to my wife. I'm like, uh, maybe we should reconsider before we shell out, you know, um, a couple grand <laughs> to go lose, lose some weight. But especially when it's like, I, I really, I actually really always looked at it as like a temporary, right. It's more of a reset, but the fact that it's, it's perpetuity, for weight it's loss. It's not how already. it's advertised. Yeah. yeah. It's advertised that you have to keep taking it. Yeah, but you know me, how it's advertised and how I'll use it isn't always the same. So <laughs> I understand why you'd advertise it that way. Um, use this forever. I've never said that ever before. Um, no. Uh, well, this is great, man. It really gave me a lot of information. I think just uh, it didn't feel crazy, but you brought up a lot of really good points. And I think challenging this idea of caloric deprivation versus metabolism is just, it's just really interesting. I can't sit here and say that I'm like totally off or in a different direction, but I definitely, I, I even feel like I can see my energies have gone down because I'm now like just thinking and it's got me thinking. So last thing I was going to say, if there's a, I don't, I don't think, and just to address that, I don't expect anyone to believe me, but I would suggest that people look into it, as you just said, and also to try it for a while. Yeah. You know, well, Fixing I was just going to ask, not something that's going to be overnight, but it's also not a lifelong commitment to try it. You can just, if you get to a point where you're 37 degrees or 98.6, you're hungry when you first wake up, you're eating regularly, you're eating in a balanced, healthy way, but abundantly, um, and after a few months, you know, no weight is left, then fair enough, I'm wrong, but you could try it. No, I think um, I was just going to ask if there's, uh, you know, if you have a, another podcast or resources you could direct me to for going after and starting to, to research and, and test out boosting the metabolism um, and going that route. So... Even testing where it's at right now, because I know I've definitely, as, as we said, I've, I've had problems with that in the past, um, many of which have improved quite a bit. Like, I'm definitely a hotter person than I used to be, um, which is great. Um, not not physically, people, just temperature-wise. So, um, but, yeah, that that that'd be – if you give me some resources, that'd be fantastic. Absolutely. All right, so I have an episode on metabolism. We'll, we'll try and link to it underneath in the show notes. Um, how do you test for it is a really great question, and we should definitely end on that. You're right. Um, the best thing um, in most cases is simply your temperature. So you get a thermometer, you make sure it's accurate. Usually it's not the digital ones because they like quite different every time you use it. But if you have a digital one that is accurate, like you put it in your mouth, you get a reading, take it out. I've been it back doing in, the, the not scans, the little one. forehead rolls. Those are the least accurate. Uh, that's, the, that's the least accurate okay. because it's the literally that. I've seen cases where people, they feel bad at 98.2 and once they're at 98.4, they're better. I've seen people who feel bad at 98, 7.8 and once they get to 9, like, so it's actually quite like. You really need high precision then. Precise. Okay. You want it to be really precise. So if you take a thermometer out, put it out, put it back in and two minutes later, it's a different temperature, even if it's you know, 0 0.2 difference, that's too much of a variation. You want it to be exactly right. It's usually old style thermometers that like used to be mercury. mercury. Okay. These days they're made with gallium because mercury is so dangerous. Um, but you can get them easily five-ish dollars on Amazon, something like that. Um, and you have to have hold them in your mouth for five minutes. So it's a bit more of a hassle, but that's really what you want. Now, the, a lot of people say first thing in the morning temperature, but your metabolism isn't usually like f at full swing first thing in the morning because you've just been kind of in an energy conserving state called sleep, right? So actually the temperature that really matters is the middle of the day. And so there's two times I suggest you do it. Before eating and after eating. Let's say lunch. So an hour, 10 minutes, whatever. Some point before lunch. And again, hour, 10 minutes, two hours, whatever. After lunch. Now, why am I saying you should do both? So middle of the day, why middle of the day? Because that's when your metabolism should be the strongest. So that's the best chance that you've got this perfect temperature that I'm talking about. But why before and after? Because that also tells us very helpful information. If, yeah, if the temperature was 
uh, significantly higher before you eat than after. It means that eating calmed you down because again, lack of food indicates to your body that there's an emergency going on. And so your real temperature is the temperature after eating. Now, if you're the opposite, if you're actually cooler before you eat and then you're warmer after you eat, that tells us two things. First of all, that your body is actually working to convert food into energy in an efficient way, which is good. But it also tells us you waited too long to eat. <laughs> you, should, you should have had lunch earlier. Um, and obviously, if it's cool both times, that just says that your metabolism is slow. If it's optimal both times, it just says that it's optimal. But So that's why it's really good to do before and okay. after. Yeah, I like that. I'm going to get some glass thermometers after this, looking like an old I know, I should doctor. sell them. <laughs> yeah, you should. <laughs> well, I don't know if you better ever sell them for very much. I can't imagine margins ever be good on something that you get $5, right? So, uh, But no, that's interesting. People okay, think so they're hard that's to get. Awesome. Like, I've got a client in Australia who's like really into all this stuff, but I have to send it to him from the UK because he can't get it. So yeah, maybe I should. But so, so that's one way. Now, if for some reason... Even the temperature seems right to you and you still feel like you have a lot of the symptoms. Uh, there is something called actual uh, mitochondrial testing that is available, costs a few hundred dollars. They take a blood test, they can test it and they can see, you know, is there some problem where your body's still not producing the right amount of ATP or is there a problem with this or something else? So th there is a blood test available, but 99% of the time, the temperature one is 100% accurate and reliable. Okay, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate that, man. This is great. This has really been exactly what I needed, um, not where I thought it would go. So I appreciate that. But um, I'm definitely going to go out and test this metabolism. I'd say for anyone that listens to this conversation, too, if you were on this boat um, on my side, too, I'd probably recommend doing the same thing because it just it seems simple for five bucks to figure out if your theory is real, right, and works for me or for whoever. Um, it's, it's a lot cheaper than Ozempic. So I'm, I'm going to try it, test out, and I'll follow up with you how it goes uh, a little bit later once I get that done. Fantastic. Oh, in terms of resources, uh, you know, the episode of metabolism, I am put, putting together a book, uh, you know, the Rejuvenate Diet, it'll be called something like that. Uh, so when that is out, uh, I will let you know to make sure to hear about that. Um, make sure make sure you're subscribed to the channel so you don't miss uh, when that's out. Is there? Can I like opt in for an email thing or anything? Just to be notified. Uh, yeah, if you go to uh, feelyounger.net, um, there should be something there. Okay, awesome, man. Well, I really appreciate your time again. I actually do have to get going, so I'm sorry. I have uh, another thing I got to bounce for, but um, again, thanks for just kind of giving me the time, and you know, happy that we were able to record this. Hopefully, it's valuable for others. But um, this is fantastic, man. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you later. But um, I got to get bouncing, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. And it just, just thanks so much. I really don't have anything else to say except for my head's spinning. I need to go check my temperature after this call just to see where it's at. So. <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed that, I recommend watching our latest episode, which you can do by clicking above. And make sure to subscribe, like the video, comment, and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it. Thank you.